Yo, what is going on guys? It is Alex with The Card Guys. I have a special video for you today. It's been a, it's a video that I've wanted to upload for a long time and it gets to be uploaded to Inch95's channel. Big shout out to him for giving us a chance to upload on his channel. Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, today is the economics of uh, Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, there's a lot of people in the community that just struggle big time with buying, selling, valuing cards, uh, knowing how to price your cards, just everything like when to sell when to buy everything so I just want to kind of cover all bases today um, I guess what I want to start with is how to price your cards like what determines the value of your cards so uh, I'm gonna start with a quick example right here um, fairy wind um, this card used to be you know maybe 10 20 cents uh, a while back uh, it, it's not a short print there's nothing that determines its value other than its playability um, so that's gonna bring me to a list of things uh, that determines, I guess, the value of a card. Um, I wrote a, like a quick list here for you, um, just so you can kind of look over it while I'm telling you. Um, the first thing that's going to determine the value of a card is its playability. Uh, the playability just trumps everything, that because there's more people that play the game than collect. There's more people that play the game than just trade cards. You know, playability is everything with a card. Um, a card like Fairy Wind just ga recently gained huge popularity, and now it's you know five six dollar card uh, and went from 20 cents you know just because of the new deck called cliff forts and so playability determines how many cards are going to be put on the internet because people see that the cards being played it's going up in price so they want to sell their cards yada yada more in stock um, collectability collectability is not nearly as I guess great of a factor as playability collectability um, there's far less collectors but cards still retain a lot of value from back in the day if you go to sets like Legend of Blue Eyes and Metal Raiders and stuff like that you can find a lot of collectible cards only a couple of which are really value valuable like uh, you know, first edition mirror forces. You know, unlimited mirror forces. They're kind of on the lower side because there's a lot more of them. Um, collect, which then again brings me to the difficulty to find. You know, uh, if you have a card that's unlimited, which means there's multiple prints of a card um, after the very first print, which is the first edition print. Um, you're going to have much more of those than the first edition print, obviously. And the first edition print is going to be a lot more. And then you're going to go to the condition. If your card's in near mint to mint condition. Obviously, it's going to be worth a lot more if you have a played card or a damaged card. I mean, even a damaged card that is not playable is not going to be worth anything, you know? I mean, if, if it's not a collectible card and then it's damaged beyond play, it's basically valueless. So, I mean, I mean, what are you going to do with that card? Somebody, obviously, is going to want it just to play with it for fun or whatever, so it's not going to be completely useless. I won't go uh, too out of hand there. But anyway, um, and then trade and cash value of a card. Um... I'm going to put these in kind of together here. Tradeability of a card, I guess, if you have cards like Vanity's Emptiness, you know, um, everybody wants Vanity's Emptiness. Uh, it's a really hard card to find. It's really expensive. It's really used. It has playability. It has difficulty to find, good condition, tradeability, everything. Um, tradeability really refers to a card that everybody's going to want in your binder. When, you, when somebody flips through your binder, they're going to, like, nine times out of ten, somebody's going to point out that card. Well, I wouldn't trade, you know, Vanity's Emptiness for a hundred of, you know, one dollar cards. If, say, a place out of Vanity's Emptiness is a hundred dollars, I wouldn't trade this for a hundred one dollar cards that not a lot of people are going to want, that you just kind of want it uh, on a whim, you know. Um, unless it's something that you really want, I mean, obviously you can trade however you want, but I'm just saying tradeability of a card determines a lot. Um, it's trade and trade and cash value. Uh, I'm going to talk about this for a second because a lot of people don't understand the difference between trade and cash value. Okay, so if I was to put these on eBay, okay, if I'm going to put these on eBay, they're going to be worth, you know, 95 to to $100, okay? But then you're going to get into a problem. You're going to have fees and all this other stuff. And so let me break down the fees for you real quick on eBay. If you're going to sell cards on eBay then you're gonna have a lot of fees and shipping and whatnot so here's kind of a breakdown of a lower level of fees so eBay is gonna charge 10% 
PayPal is going to charge 2.9% plus 30 cents for every transaction that you do. And then to ship a card, uh, this is how I ship cards. Um, I did a breakdown of you know everything that I use to ship cards, which is I guess what I recommend for you. Um, I buy a, like a pack of envelopes like this, real cheap from like Kroger or something, um, and they're three cents per envelope. Top loaders are 10 cents per envelope. Stamps are 49 cents each, and then a sleeve is roughly five six cents or something. So it all comes out to be about 68. cents if you're ch shipping you know cheap cards like five dollar you know five dollar ten dollar less cards um, and so if you sell a card um, say you sell it for three dollars you're gonna have an eBay fee of 30 cents you're gonna have a PayPal fee of 2.9 percent of this plus the 30 cents that's just comes with every transaction you're gonna end up making a dollar 64 so if you're gonna be trading a card you're gonna trade it for its max value whatever it's listed for on eBay but if you're gonna be selling that card um, a lot of people are not going to be willing to pay full value and the reason they're not going to be willing to pay full value is because you're not going to get full value even if you sell it on eBay for three dollars you're going to get a dollar sixty four because of shipping and then fees and everything like that so if somebody offers you a dollar fifty for a three dollar card it looks to me like it would be worth it not to have to go on eBay list it out uh, try to sell it for something that it's not worth you know so when vendors are buying cards Vendors don't have to pay all of these fees because they have a long-standing website where they don't have they can get around all these fees and stuff. So um, they have you know worked out their financials and everything where they don't have to worry about this. But individual sellers like ourselves who want to just sell cards on eBay have to pay these fees. And so if somebody offers me a dollar fifty for a three dollar card, I'm going to take it instantly because there's there's no point in not doing it I don't care about this 14 cents that I'm gonna make if I go on eBay spend all my time listing the card spend all my time driving to the store to sell it which then you got gas and yeah I'm not gonna go into that that's disregard this but um anyway but if I go up to a farther up on the chain to like a ten dollar card I still have the same amount of fees almost a little more fee comes from you know the actual selling price there's thirty cents on this and a dollar on this that comes off for the eBay fee and then a little bit more for the PayPal fee but still look you're making eight dollars as opposed to uh, you know a dollar fifty or whatever here so if somebody offers me seven dollars for a ten dollar card I'm gonna take that because I mean that's it's just a dollar difference unless I have a lot of stock, a lot of inventory, and I'm selling a ton of cards, and a dollar on ten different cards is going to make a di big difference. Then I don't have to worry about it. But see, vendors and stuff, they'll pay, I don't know, for a three dollar card, they might pay a dollar, a dollar and a quarter, right? Because on their website, what are they selling it for? They're selling it for three dollars, and they're not having to pay nearly as much fees as we are, so they can afford to get away with that. Um, and so if you're going to come up to a vendor and sell a card for a dollar fifty, boom, sell it. If you're going to sell a $10 card and he offers you $4 for it, a $4.03 difference might be worth it for you to keep that card and try to trade it off. Um, so another thing you're going to have to worry about the farther up in the chain that you go with selling cards, if I start selling cards like Vanity's Emptiness, that's $30 a card, say it's $90. Um, and I'm going to have to pay for tracking because there's a thing that people don't understand when shipping. If a card gets lost in the mail, PayPal is going to cover whoever bought the cards. They're going to give the money back to them. You're going to end up with no money, and you're going to have no cards. So if you ship some something to somebody, they can be, you know, awful about it. And if you didn't provide tracking, they can just say they didn't got it and they didn't get it. I'm sorry, and that could be a bad situation. Um, so tracking, big thing uh, to include because it gives PayPal. Um, you're basically you're getting backed by PayPal too because the tracking can tell you that it did get there. Um, so if you're shipping expensive cards, my re my like I guess average is twenty to twenty five dollars where I would determine whether I want to put shipping on it because tracking is going to cost you you know roughly four fifty six is how I like that's the cheapest way I've found to ship cards in a bubble mailer and so that's that's that um, and people also want to know where to ship cards I guess um, like like the best way to sell cards the best way to value cards um, here's another quick thing eBay 
eBay is your friend. eBay is the best way to value cards because it is current. It is up to date. It is up to minutes. Like, minutes ago somebody could have bought something. It'll show up on eBay's sold listings. Um, so the best way to price cards is to look at the buy it now and then go to the lowest. That is what somebody on the, on the other end of a transaction could potentially pay for this card. If you're going to be selling it to them, then you can start using, you know, my chart here to show you, like, the best like the best price that you can get for your card and make it worth it for you um, and you know you're not gonna have to like look at this every time you're gonna start to get the feel for it and everything but um go to sold listings and that'll tell you what people are actually buying cards for if you go to the buy it now lowest that's just what somebody could potentially pay for it now but sold listings is much better because that's what people are actually paying for it people don't realize that buy it now is like they're still listed. These items are still listed. Nobody's bought them. There's a reason that nobody's bought them is because they could possibly be too high. So why would I use a price like if a card's $10 and then there's 15 of them listed for $15 but nobody's buying them, guess what's going to happen? The price is going to go back down to $10 to what the card is actually worth. So I'm not going to value the card at $15. I'm going to buy it at what people are actually paying for it, which is $10. That makes a lot of sense, right? So I mean, a lot of people get confused there and don't realize that. Another thing that determines the value, I guess, is whether the card is going up or down in price. Did the card just randomly shoot up in price? Is it still going up? I mean, that's something you'd have to just figure out on your own. There's not really a good way um, to determine that. You can go on, you know, the sold listings and look at the dates of a card's going from 2 to 4 to 6 to 8. I mean, obviously it's going up. If it's staying about the same, then you can figure it out from there. Um, the second best place to go is TCG Player. This is where basically all of the top sellers all mesh together and uh, you can see prices from, you know, compared from a ton of different stores. Um, a huge mistake that I see every a lot of people use is using this Yu-Gi-Oh! Prices app. This Prices app gives you a very delayed fluctuation of prices and it's not current, I guess. It updates every now and then, but it's never current. I've never found it to be a reliable source. Um, for card prices. It'll give you a roundabout estimate, I guess, but a lot of times it can be completely wrong. So stay away from this app if you're trying to price cards um, to use, like to trade with somebody or sell cards or whatever. Always use eBay first, and then if you can't find it on eBay, use TCG Player and see if they have any. And then you'd get back to a card not being in stock completely. Uh, you could just end up with a bad situation there. Um, Another quick thing I want to talk about um, earlier when I was mis uh, mentioning difficulty to find uh, cards. I'm going to go through a few cards that people have trouble, you know, determining the value of because um, they don't they don't understand the value of these kind of cards. Okay. So I'll start back with Vanity's Emptiness. Vanity's Emptiness is a short print from a short printed set. There is no, like you see how it says first edition on the card here? There is no unlimited print of Vanity's Emptiness because the set was short printed. It would never went to an unlimited set. Uh, as far as I know anyway. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's how this works. Um, and that's why this card's $30 and it's common. It was a short print out of a short printed set. set. Does that make sense? Like, um... This card is extremely hard to find and everybody wants it, so the stock, the limited availability of it makes it extremely valuable. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is foreign cards. Foreign cards people don't understand. Um, so uh, here I have four different kinds of foreign cards, okay? A foreign heavy storm is not going to be worth more, right? Um, a lot of people think that foreign cards are just instantly worth a ton more. Well, this is one of those exceptions. Like, this this came from the set Metal Raiders. Metal Raiders is a lot easier to find um, for the old cards in first edition like this, foreign. Um, so it's not worth more. It's actually worth less than the first edition English heavy storm. Um, so that's one example, I guess. Another example is cards that are useful that are foreign but they're not, I guess, necessarily easy to find. So, I mean, if I'm going to get this card, I'm going to either have to get it from overseas or I'm going to have to get it from somebody who got it overseas. And so this one's going to have a, a larger value, but I guess the general rule of thumb is for for English users, um, and I found this to be true in most situations, some people would argue with this, but German is one of the easier languages to find, so you want to add a few dollars to a German card, say like this is an eight dollar card, I'd probably value it at like twelve dollars. Um, uh, Italian and French are both of the other like harder to find cards. 
and more people want them so they're harder to find. Um, I would value, if this was a French card, I would value it at like $15, $16 um, if it was an $8 to $10 card. Um, <coughs> some people might um, disagree with that, but that's what I've found to be true most of the time. And then a card like this where it's more expensive and definitely harder to find uh, in a harder language like Italian like these are, um, I would definitely value these since they're about 30 to 32. Most people would agree with me that these are about 45, 43 dollars um, because of how hard they are to find and the most wanted language. Um, so there's that. And then another price uh, increase, like I said, with the older hard to find cards, first edition really, really matters on something like this. The Stardust Dragon is not the most used card, but the like highest rarity of something in first edition will always retain its value for the most part. Um, a card like this, you know, it was whatever the guy in the you know, Yu-Gi-Oh series or whatever was using this as like his trump card, so it's always going to retain some collector value and it's going to retain um, its first edition mint, you know, value too. So same thing with the Black Rose Dragon and same thing with um, Ulti Veilers. Um, Ulti Veilers are one of the prettiest ultimate rares and a lot of people really, really want them simply because of that. I mean, they're not exactly the most useful card right now, but first edition Ulti Veilers are just going to retain their value no matter what. Um, that's pretty much all I have for you today, guys. I really hope this helped. Um, there's a lot of stuff that people need to know. Um, share this information. Um, like, just, I don't know, marketing with Yu-Gi-Oh, there's a lot to it, so it's hard to fit it in in a video like this. Um, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Again, big shout-out to Inch95 for letting us upload on his channel, and I will catch you guys later.